Well, thank you all for braving not terrible weather, but, you know, a little drizzly Washington weather and a lot of traffic. At least I found a lot of traffic getting here. Uh, my name is Ashish Shah. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown. Um, very excited to spend uh, some time with all of you this evening. Um, really excited about what is in front of us over the next couple of hours, hour, hour and a half that we're going to be talking. Um, there are really two parts of this evening. I mean, one is the substantive conversation we are going to have about what I would argue is one of the most important policy issues in front of us. Um, but also it's an opportunity to talk about CAPER, which is the Center for Advancing Health Policy through Research at Brown University. This is a new center, newish center at the Brown School of Public Health, um, really trying to bring evidence and science and data, because those things still matter, um, to uh, some of the most pressing health policy questions in front of us. And one of the most pressing health policy questions in front of us, and I would argue is actually not the, one of the most pressing health policy questions, it's just one of the most pressing policy questions, given the impact of the Medicare program. One of the most pressing policy questions in front of us is what does the future of Medicare look like? Um, how should we be thinking about Medicare? Medicare um, has undergone a, gone a lot of changes just in the last 20 years. Uh, and with the Affordable Care Act, which obviously primarily focused on insurance expansion, also implemented a lot of other changes on quality and cost and delivery uh, that has had profound impacts on Medicare. And I will say um, some of them have been unexpected, at least to me. I mean, maybe there are others in the room who could have predicted exactly where we would be. Uh, I wasn't one of them. And so it has been enlightening and given the importance of Medicare to our uh, seniors to other populations, given the importance of Medicare to our federal budget, given the importance of Medicare in terms of setting the tone for the rest of the healthcare system, uh, thinking through these issues is going to be really, really important. And so when we thought about this evening and thought about who we would love to have, who would be the ideal person to get us going, um, all of us knew that there was one person more than anybody else that we would ideally love, and we didn't know if he'd be willing to and able to do it, but he is, so that's John Blum who is the principal deputy at CMS, used to run the Center for Medicare under President Obama, 2009 to 2014, um, has had broad experience in government, worked on the Hill, uh, worked in OMB, has had broad experience outside of government, uh, including having worked uh, as, uh, as a senior official in the Blues, and so understands private payers, obviously public payers, budgets, legislation, and um, so we reached out to John and said, would you be willing to come and kick us off and, and frame some of the conversations about the future of Medicare, the future of Medicare Advantage? And then after John speaks, we're going to have a panel. Um, I will introduce the moderator for the panel, and then we'll have a really rich discussion. So without further ado, John Blum. John, thank you. Well, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And I uh, totally agree. This is one of the most pressing um, policy problems for CMS, for how we think about the MA program, for how we think about the future of Medicare. And I thought rather than trying to get too wonky, would start with maybe three stories. And uh, this is now my second time here at CMS. And I took a vow really to spend more time, not here in DC, but really out into the country. And, and to travel more, to listen more, to really see what's happening. And really in the post-COVID environment, we were very curious to what is happening um, throughout um, the healthcare systems. And a couple of things really stick with me. Um, two is travel, uh, third story personal. And in November, we traveled out to Washington State. And so the goal there was to really see what's happening through our, our rural countries, what's happening to rural hospitals, and, and how we need to think about doing more just to shore up rural health care. So the CMS team that wanted, um, wanted, to, wanted to, to do a stop, it was November, when Medicare beneficiaries choose their health plans. They go through a process, they have to select, CMS really encourages um, um, all Medicare beneficiaries to think about their options during the fall. So we want to do a drive-by to a ship's, uh, ship center, and ships um, help to counsel um, uh, Medicare beneficiaries. They're, they're volunteers. They help Medicare beneficiaries really sort their choices out and to choose the plans best for them. We stopped by that center, that, this, this uh, 
this community center, and there was a line out the door. It was, it was, was packed. And the center director said, please leave, do not come. And we wanted to thank folks. We wanted to say thank you for doing your service. Thank you for um, helping Medicare beneficiaries uh, choose their options. The health center director was freaked out. The ship, ship volunteers were freaked out. They said, please leave. And the thing that was most striking about this was the Medicare beneficiaries who came to that center, they had fear in their eyes. They were worried. They were worried for themselves. They were worried for their spouses. And you could tell they were so worried just to have time with that ship counselor to figure out their choices, figure out their options. And so in the world of trying to make Medicare better, to try and have more choices, more private plan options, we have created this menu that is tremendously confusing, that is tremendously overwhelming. And so rather than the Medicare program right now being a place that we can welcome new mental care beneficiaries coming into the program, we have fear. We have um, beneficiaries who are too afraid that they're going to make the wrong choice. And so I think that story just comes out. I think it's one of the key questions for us is, how do we make the program simpler? How do we make it easier? How do we take fear kind of out of the process? But just going to that health center, going to that community center, seeing volunteers, seeing the line out the door was just telling for how much confusion, for how much fear that we now have in our program. The second story is that in May, uh, we traveled to Puerto Rico. And for folks that follow um, what's happening down, to, down in the territories is that we have a health system down there that's crumbled, that's, that's in disarray. We have too few doctors. We have not enough health care providers. And those that are uh, using the health care system there have a lot of challenge to get care. So we toured a hospital, and we, that hospital was filled to the brim. There were patients literally lining the halls in beds who were clearly Medicare beneficiaries, clearly those who are duly eligible that couldn't get into the couldn't get into the hospital, and they were sick, really sick, really frail, and you can just see to their fear in their eyes. And for those that also follow Puerto Rico, know that it has the highest penetration rate. For, uh, for beneficiaries who are um, served by Medicare, served by Medicare and Medicaid. Close to 90% of, of those living in the, uh, the island uh, choose to receive their benefits or get pushed to receive their benefits uh, through the MA program. And we have raised rates to, to address some of these concerns. And what's happening now in Puerto Rico is rather than paying providers better, rather than trying to shore the network up, the plans are giving away benefits that would shock us. They're giving away dog walking services. They're giving away, uh, they're giving away car, uh, uh, car repair services, really in the name of, well, this is helping to promote social benefits, helping to promote um, Better, better social life for the for their beneficiaries, but they're not providing the core benefits of services. Not making sure that beneficiaries can get access to care, can get into the technical details. But what is happening throughout the program, most dark through um, through Puerto Rico, is this dynamic that plans now compete upon not the quality of care, not the quality through their network but how much supplemental, supplemental benefits that really pushes the edge to what a true healthcare service is. And so that's, that story sticks with me. We're seeing the, the hospital that can't get enough, um, can't get enough throughput and, and patients lining the hallways trying to get access to care for heart surgery, cardiology, et cetera, truly frail, frail beneficiaries. And meanwhile, the plans are providing um, dog walking services, car repair services, that we can make an argument why that's the case, but I think the first principle should be the MA program should, should first and foremost do better for their beneficiaries. The third story is um, my dad's call to me each fall where he says, you know, where he says, um, help me choose the right plan. And so my dad called this, uh, called this fall and said he was thinking about changing plans because the plan that called him said they would give him $200 uh, in, uh, in per month, really in cash benefits. 
The plan didn't call and say, hey, we have a better network. The plan didn't call and say, we have um, better quality of care. That if you're in the hospital, Mr. Blum, that we're going to take care of you better. No, the plan said that we're going to offer you $200 per month so you can go to the drugstore and buy things you don't need. And so my dad's not the wealthiest person, but he doesn't need $200, $200 a month. And just to illustrate what we have seen in the program that is competing on how we pay cash not how we get back to the core programs. So those three stories stick with me, and I couldn't be happier to hear that you're having this forum because I really think there's five key questions that we collectively need to think about what's the best course um, for the MA program, Medicare Advantage. The first is how do we think about the payment? And so the history of the program says that we tie the payment, that we tie the risk adjustment, that we tie the quality measurement really back to the fee-for-service Medicare program. And that concept made sense when the MA program was 5% total, 10% total. Now it's 50%. In Puerto Rico, it's close to 90%. So we have to really think, what is the right payment level, the, the right benchmark, and how to think about what is the right sort of um, policy payment framework to the starting points, and how do we get it right? Second is, um, we have struggled to define how we risk adjust the payments um, to these plans. And so it is certainly true that compared to when the program started, that the health profiles mirror the overall Medicare program. And so the concern, say, 20, uh, 25 years ago was that the health plans would cherry pick and you know really market to the healthy. And now we change that dynamic and plans really market to those who are sicker. But um, they have strong incentives really to, to, um, uh, to maximize those codes to ensure that the risk-adjusted payment is truly high. So I think the second core challenge for the program is how do we build risk adjustment so it gets back to the roots of creating a full-level playing field and now creating the incentive that we want to maximize the codes. The third is going back to the, you know, the two stories that I cited is how do we shift the program back to what its goals are when the ACA was passed that we really encourage plans to compete based upon the quality of care, the quality of the outcomes. We have um, modified the program, and CMS is surely guilty of this, to really change how plans compete, not based upon the quality care, the quality outcomes, but on the overall um, supplemental benefit packages. Again, think about my dad you know, considering changing plans because he was going to be offered $200 per month, uh, which he does not need, nor should the program pay. But that's how we've changed the program, and CMS is certainly guilty of um, promoting that. Um, the fourth area, if I can read my, uh, uh, read my writing, is um, how do we think about what is the right, uh, the right benefit levels? What is truly valuable? What is truly right? If we want the MA program to, um, to offer more services than traditional Medicare, what is the right sort of benefit framework? How do we think, and think about it? What is dental care? What is vision? What is the things that we want the program to provide? And I think we need to do a lot more work there to truly respect what beneficiaries want from the Medicare program and what is the best value. And then I think the last thing that we need to think hard about is how we think about what we saw in, uh, saw in uh, uh, Washington State, that fear in the eyes, the fear that they were going to make a mistake, the fear they weren't going to have enough time with the ship director. Why should it take 30, 40 minutes um, to go through that process? Why should it be scary? Why should it be fearful? And so I need... So I think we need to do a lot more work to really simplify the process, make it easier, make it simpler. That should be the, the expectation that we ask for the Medicare program that all of you demand for CMS to do a whole lot better. Um, but that fear sticks with me, and I think it should really frame how we think about the next, next phase of the program. So with that. Um. That was extraordinary, John. Thank you. But, you know, um, having sp served a, a little bit of time in government, um, when you're a senior policy official, the temptation is to come to forums like this and gloss over the issues, talk about how everything is great. 
if there is anything that's not great, it's somebody else's fault, certainly not yours. Um, but it's okay because you fixed it and, and it's great. Um, look, Medicare is a great program for our country. It's a, it's a treasure. But the program has got real challenges. And I don't think I have heard a clear elucidation of the challenges than what, just, what John just did in the last seven to 10 minutes. So thank you for that. That was terrific. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the next phase of the conversation, and I'm going to introduce Andy Ryan, who is uh, going to be our uh, moderator for the evening. Um, we recruited Andy from the University of Michigan uh, to Brown to start this new center I mentioned. Um, Andy has been doing extraordinary work on health policy, payments, uh, pay for performance, just a whole ACOs and how to think about them, uh, just for a very long time. and and. Uh, as Andy started really doing the very best work, I realized I need to get out and I, you know, I need to start working on something else because I used to do this stuff. So then I picked this thing called pandemics and I was like, well, maybe there'll be a pandemic and I can work on that. Um, which, uh, but I, I'm just kidding, obviously. But the point is, it's not that funny. Okay, fine. Um, but the point is, uh, it's hard to think about somebody who has been doing more impactful work on thinking about uh, Medicare and payments um, than Andy Ryan. So we were thrilled to recruit him to Brown and... Uh, that was a couple of years ago, and in the last couple of years, uh, he's really put together an extraordinary group of faculty, um, which continues to grow, and we've had some great support from uh, from a variety of, of, of external folks. So I'm not going to talk more about that. I'm just going to turn it over to Andy, who's going to introduce our panel for the evening. And I think we're going to probably get into a lot of the issues that John uh, raised. So Andy Ryan, to you. Thank you so much, Ashish and John, for those extraordinary remarks. I'll keep my uh, comments brief here. Um, you know, so as Ashish mentioned, I'm the director for the Center for Advancing Health Policy through research at Brown. And so we are focused on generating the highest quality evidence about the forces that shape affordability, access, value in U.S. healthcare, and translating that towards informed policymaking. The translation part's really important. I think many of you know that despite how great academics are and how good our research is, it doesn't always make the impact that we think it should. There's a couple of reasons for that. One being we're not answering the questions that policymakers need to know. And secondly, we're not giving policymakers the information at the time they need it to make those decisions. And so th those are two of the shortcomings we're trying to address with the center. So let me just say uh, briefly about you know, this session and why we're talking about Medicare Advantage. And, and really, we're, we're at a juncture where, you know, there's two halves of Medicare right now. There's two halves. There's traditional Medicare and there's Medicare Advantage. And we know a lot about traditional Medicare. I mean, we've been studying, studying it for a very long time. We know a lot of its shortcomings, its foibles, it's the overused, lack of coordination, the variation, the skimpy benefits, all that stuff. We've been studying it, and arguably we've been studying it even more intensively after the ACA within all the new alternative payment models, reforms. And while we were doing this, Medicare Advantage grew, and it grew, and it grew. And I think many of us have similar stories where, you know, in our class about health policy, health systems, whatever, we had one slide about Medicare Advantage, which showed, like, the trends, enrollment trends. And then we're like, oh, it's a 20%. Next year, we're like, 25%, 30%, 40%. And I, I just, I mentioned that because this all happened without the kind of scrutiny that I think researchers, the research community has given to traditional Medicare. And so many of the issues that John just raised, they're not, it's not like they're unknown, but they haven't received the kind of thought and attention that we, that we pay to traditional Medicare. So we're trying to you know, make up for lost time here and talk about these issues tonight. And so this is what we're going to do with our panel tonight. So um, we have uh, three excellent speakers. Um, that will go in turn, and then I'm, I'll moderate a discussion. So the first is Erica Sacker. So Erica is the Vice President of Healthcare at Arnold Ventures. Her portfolio includes uh, payment reform and the Medicare program. And she um, received her PhD in political science and then worked at OMB before going to 
Arnold. The next speaker is David Myers. David is a colleague of mine at Brown, an assistant professor and expert in Medicare Advantage. And then finally, Aaron Fusay Brown. Aaron is the Catherine C. Henson Professor of Law, the director of the Center for um, Health, Law, and Society at Georgia State University, an expert on health and administrative law, and has broad expertise in um, health policy. So, um, Erica, why don't you come first, and then we'll each panelist will give brief remarks before we start our discussion. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much for the introduction, Andy, um, and for having me here today. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm gonna build a little bit on what both Andy and John said, both about the growth in the program and what some of the, some of the implications are and questions that I think policymakers will need to grapple with. Um, there has been substantial growth in Medicare Advantage, there's been substantial growth in Medicare Advantage over the past decade in particular. And last year was the first year that the majority of Medicare beneficiaries were enrolled in Medicare Advantage. And just to give you a sense of what the pace of the growth has been, back in 2010, you had one in every four uh, uh, Medicare beneficiaries that were enrolled in Medicare Advantage. Last year, it was just over half, and that continued this year. And then within the next decade, it's projected to be 60% of the Medicare program. So as Andy just said, it's really, a, it's really a large share of the program. It's a growing share of the program. And I think it's rightfully starting to get, just over the past year or two, more attention from policymakers as a result. Um, what I'm going to do is walk through why the program has been growing so much, build on some of what's been said there, and talk about some of the implications for Medicare spending, for beneficiaries, and for some of the technical policy details of the program. Um, and I hope at the end of this, you come away with the idea that regardless of whether you think the growth in Medicare Advantage is a good thing or a bad thing, I know the idea of Medicare Advantage for all is something that has been out there, that there are still some implications about the growth of the program that policymakers really need to start to more seriously grapple with over the next few years. Okay, so why has Medicare Advantage been growing so much? As Andy said, 20%, 25%, now we're at like 51, 52%. And like, how has that happened? And a big part of the reason, I mean, there are a number of factors that drive it, but it really comes back to the fact that we subsidize Medicare Advantage at a much higher rate than we pay in traditional Medicare. So based on MedPAC's latest estimates, they estimate that we're paying 123% in Medicare Advantage, what we pay in traditional Medicare. And this translates into $88 billion in excess payments in 2024 alone from coding, which was mentioned, and from favorable selection, which is where healthier people are more likely to enroll in Medicare Advantage. And these overpayments are really fueling a lot of the growth that we see in Medicare Advantage um, because plans get more back in rebate dollars and they're able to offer some of these generous benefits. You know how virtually all plans offering things like dental, hearing, vision, gym memberships. And then you have a number of plans that are offering additional benefits beyond that that, as John said, like really start to get a little further and further away from what we think of maybe as like core um, health benefits. And these are benefits that aren't available in the traditional Medicare program. And so it does make the program really popular among beneficiaries and at enrollment time, um, it is something that they're considering. The overpayments and Medicare Advantage, so this is the 88 billion kind of plus a year that I mentioned, this stems from a couple of different factors. So there's things like the quality bonus program that increase payments, the level that the MA benchmarks are set at, favorable selection. Um, but one thing I'll highlight in particular that was mentioned is the coding of beneficiary diagnoses and the way that risk adjustment works in the Medicare Advantage program. Um, basically, plans can inflate their risk scores, make beneficiaries appear sicker than they are, and that increases payments to plans, plan revenues, um, and allows them to compete more on these extra benefits. And so that's really a major driver of the overpayments. It's 50 billion in um, over 50 billion in 2024 alone, so more than half of the overpayment issue. Um, and these overpayments, whether it's due to coding or to other factors, it's really leading to increases in Medicare spending and contributing to Medicare's fiscal challenges. Um, and there's implications for Medicare solvency as well. So a little over 40% of um, 
a little over 40% of MA spending is funded out of the hospital insurance trust fund. Hospital insurance trust funds projected to be insolvent in 2031. Um, and so that's not, it's not super close in Congress's terms, but it is like starting to, to, to come up. And I think it's increasingly hard to have a serious conversation about what we're gonna do about Medicare spending, what we're going to do to address Medicare solvency without thinking about how Medicare Advantage is part of that discussion. I think it just has to be at this point, given the role that it's playing in the program. Um, and these overpayments, they don't just affect taxpayers. The beneficiaries are paying more too as a result. In 2024, they're gonna pay 13 billion more in higher Part B premiums and Medicare. And I think one thing that's important to note is this is all Medicare beneficiaries that are paying more in premiums as a result. And that includes beneficiaries that are in traditional Medicare that are not getting the extra benefits um, that people in MA are getting. I think a fair question as we think about overpayments is to ask whether Medicare Advantage is delivering more value to beneficiaries, is it delivering higher quality care? And that might be something that in exchange for the extra we're spending makes it worth it. Um, David's gonna walk more through the evidence here, so I won't say much, um, but I will just say that my own read of the evidence on quality and Medicare Advantage relative to traditional Medicare is that it's really mixed. Um, there are some measures where MA is doing better. There are some things where MA and traditional Medicare are about the same. And there's some places where Medicare Advantage doesn't seem to be doing as well and some, some, different, um, some different outcomes that raise potential concerns. So disenrollment, for example, from Medicare Advantage plans is higher among um, beneficiaries that have a lot of health needs. And that raises some questions about why that's happening and the care that's being provided in these plans. Um, beyond the fiscal implications, a second implication that I think we should think about is whether traditional Medicare can continue to serve as a strong competitor and as a check on Medicare Advantage. One way to think about traditional Medicare is that it kind of functions like a public option in the market and puts pressure on Medicare Advantage plans to compete by delivering actual better, more coordinated care and by lowering costs. Um, there's not much competition within the MA market itself. Many markets are dominated by really a small number of insurers, and so I think we can't expect that competition to happen within MA. Um, and traditional Medicare plays a really important role there. I think it also serves as an important backstop for beneficiaries that have significant health needs who have the option to continue to opt into traditional Medicare if their needs are not being served well by Medicare Advantage plans. And I think with the growth in MA, one thing that's happened, and I think we've kind of unintentionally let this happen, and that hasn't been an active, very active policy choice, is we've really let the role of traditional Medicare diminish in the program. And so I think its ability to kind of act as this check and as a, a competitor to Medicare Advantage um, is really increasingly hampered. And then the final thing I'll say, um, I also think the growth in Medicare Advantage, it does create some of these technical issues that were mentioned, particularly around the payment benchmarks. Um, as was already said, when the program was first envisioned, it was never envisioned that it would be quite as large as it is today. And so there are some design features of the program, like the fact that um, the, the payments are based on fee-for-service spending that just aren't working as well now that the program's growing. Um, and so that's a thing that I think policymakers will need to think through. How do we actually want to pay MA plans? What should that be based on? Um, I'm happy to say more in the discussion, but I, the final thought I'd leave you with, I think growth in Medicare Advantage is really likely to continue without major policy changes. I think we've seen a number of times over the past 15 years or so where changes have been made um, and there has been kind of this outcry around the Medicare Advantage market being um, demolished and enrollment going down and we just haven't seen that occur. And plans have fi found ways to adjust to continue to offer extra benefits that have become richer and richer over time. Um, and I think that growth is likely to continue without really major changes um, that might be of a scale that policymakers might not really easily be willing to engage in. Um, and I think that should include, and the discussion should include, changes to traditional Medicare as well. I think it will be hard to really level the playing field um, without some attention to that. Um, so these issues aren't going away anytime soon. I think the growth will continue. The things I listed out as kind of implications, I think policymakers will need to find a way to address. I'm hoping Erin can give us a really good sense of what um, they can actually do about that. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. So uh, my name is David. Uh, as Andy said, I'm an assistant professor at Brown. I'm a health economist, and I study the Medicare Advantage program is where uh, most of my, my research lays. And my role on this panel is to sort of give a high-level uh, summary of what the evidence currently looks like in Medicare Advantage when we think about how MA performs relative to traditional Medicare and where some of the opportunities are and where some of the challenges might be in sort of how these programs are working. Um, so I, I think from the 10,000 foot view, like it is a mixed bag. There, there are some areas, and, and I'll get into it a little bit, where MA um, does perform quite well, but there are plenty of other areas where there are challenges and opportunities to sort of address those. Um, so I, I think it's already been highlighted quite a bit uh, this evening that MA is popular, it's growing. I, I won't uh, sort of repeat what has been said about sort of what's driving that growth. Um, one thing that I'll add uh, that I think is sort of another interesting feature of MA that's different from traditional Medicare is that most people actually enroll in plans that have zero dollar premiums. And so these plans both have supplemental benefits that do a lot to attract people into plans. But when you're coming to the point to make a plan choice, a lot of MA plans, actually, you don't have to pay a monthly premium. And the other costs that you might pay in terms of network design and in terms of cost sharing might not be as visible when somebody's enrolling in a plan. But it's likely one of the other factors that's contributing to the growth. You can enroll in the zero dollar plan uh, from MA, or you can pay a Part B premium, you can pay a Part D premium, you can then get a Medigap plan which can be quite expensive. And so it makes sense why a lot of people are making these choices when you're comparing sort of the two programs and what the affordability, affordability looks like at the outset. Um, as far as this growth, I, I think it's, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the growth at, at earlier in the program might have been among healthier people, but really everybody is enrolling in Medicare Advantage at this point. Um, we do see in, in work that we've done and others have done that the growth has been largest among um, black and Hispanic beneficiaries. It's been quite high among dual eligibles in recent years. There's a lot of payment incentives around duals in the MA program that's leading to a lot of that growth. Um, and the growth is coming from sort of all corners of the Medicare program. It's not just new people who are turning 65 and choosing MA as their first plan choice. It's a lot of people who are already in traditional Medicare for a number of years and then are seeing Medicare Advantage as an option to switch into. And I think that that's important to keep in mind. This isn't just sort of a new enrollment. It's kind of coming from previous enrollees as well. Um, so what do we know once people enroll in the Medicare Advantage program? How does access to care look? So one of the key differences that, that we've kind of touched on between Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare is that MA plans can use utilization controls. And, and in some ways, that's where a lot of the potential is, because they can do things to uh, guide people through their care that traditional Medicare doesn't have the ability to do, uh, things like designing networks of care, things like using prior authorization requirements. Um, and, and so what does that typically look like? Um, so generally, um, what we found and what others have found is that about 40% of beneficiaries in MA are enrolled in very narrow primary care networks. Um, so primary care, uh, about 40%, about 40% are in quite wide networks, so there's a lot of variability there. Um, but we do see that primary care is one of the areas where there are fewer uh, providers available in some of these networks. Um, specialty care uh, actually tends to look pretty good. Uh, most uh, MA networks have pretty wide networks for specialty care, the one exception being uh, cancer care, where we've found uh, in some work that we've done and work that others have done that MA beneficiaries seem to have a lot less access to sort of top national cancer hospitals relative to people in traditional Medicare, which is of uh, concern to, to a lot of people. Um, the areas where there are the biggest network issues, though, tend to be in mental and behavioral health. Um, so we found, others have found, that there's a huge shortage of psychiatrists, uh, social workers, mental health therapists, um, substance abuse specialists who are available sort of in these planned networks. And so um, for people who are seeking that type of care, there are often challenges in being able to see a provider. Um, we know a lot less about what the utilization controls look like in terms of prior authorization requirements. Um, this is not something where there is a lot of data that's currently being collected. Um, uh, I, I think there's opportunities to collect more data there. Um, but we actually don't have a great national sense of how many claims are necessarily being denied, how many claims have sort of long prior authorization approval processes. There's some work that estimates maybe about 40% of services are subject to a prior authorization, but it's hard actually right now with the current state of the evidence to see what things look like. Um, as far as utilization, the other thing that we do tend to see is that MA beneficiaries tend to go to uh, lower quality facilities, um, uh, particularly in nursing homes, home health, and, and also lower quality hospitals. 
hospitals. Um, but actually, in some cases, they also are less likely to go to the lowest quality hospitals. So uh, MA plans tend to steer people to kind of middle performers, so not the places that might uh, more actively harm somebody's care, but uh, not also the places that might have the most benefits for enrollees. Um, so what do we know about utilization in the program? Um, so this is an area where actually the evidence is, is a lot more clear, that MA does seem to reduce utilization. Um, MA beneficiaries have uh, fewer hospital stays. They have shorter lengths of stay when they do go to the hospital. They have much less post-acute care and nursing home long-term care. And so that is an area where a lot of the research is in, in agreement. And uh, a lot of the evidence is also hasn't found that there are necessarily uh, detrimental impacts on patient outcomes from sort of these reduced utilizations, and that there might be some spillovers onto people in TM, that when MA penetration is really high in an area, um, both uh, MA uh, sort of lengths of stay in like a nursing home might go down, but also it's lower for people in traditional Medicare. Um, so I, th I think that that's the area where maybe the evidence is clearest about the Medicare Advantage program, is that there are uh, sort of lower utilization of care. Um, I, I will say, though, that there has been some recent work that's pointing out that some of that story might be changing. Um, a lot of the research, and this is uh, sort of one of the limitations of a lot of the research that's been done on Medicare Advantage so far, is that a lot of it took place when MA was 20% of the market. And when it's 20% of the market, the people who are enrolled in plans might look really different than the people who are enrolled in plans now. And now that we're in a world where 50% are in MA and 50% are in TM, a lot of the past research, when people are sort of replicating these studies, they're not seeing as strong of results because a lot of these selection issues might have been addressed. If everybody's enrolled in MA, um, the people who are there aren't sort of cherry-picked, one might say. Um, and so some of the outcomes seem to be coming uh, more similar to each other. Um, so what do we know about quality of care in the MA program? Um, so that's another area, and I think Erica mentioned this, where, where the evidence is, is pretty mixed. Um, there is some evidence that MA plan uh, beneficiaries do receive um, sort of more cancer screenings, more different screening services. There's some ability for plans to help deliver that to beneficiaries. Um, there's somewhat lower readmissions in MA relative to TM, and that, that seems to be pretty robust. Um, although some of these findings, again, are changing. There, there was a recent study that I think showed this pretty starkly, that if you compared readmissions mission rates for things like AMI uh, in the MA program about 10 years ago, MA was doing a terrific job. People were being readmitted much less frequently. But if you look at the same data in more recent years, pretty much all those differences have gone away. And a lot of it is because the uh, underlying needs of people in both programs are kind of balancing in some ways, and some of those selection effects are going away. Um, so once people are enrolled in MA, what do we know about their experiences with, with the plans? Um, and so uh, people are enrolling in MA, so, so there is uh, clearly uh, people are choosing to opt into this program. Um, and people do tend, when you take uh, sort of different surveys, people do often tend to report that their plans are rated pretty high as far as their sort of care satisfaction. But one of the other things that we see, and that Erica mentioned as well, is that certain beneficiaries might not be served as well by different plans. Um, in particular, we've done a lot of work others have as well that find that beneficiaries with higher health needs, beneficiaries with a lot of specific chronic conditions, tend to disenroll from their plans at substantially higher rates, and that there's a lot of variation across plans. There are some plans that do a really great job of sort of retaining their sicker enrollees, and there are other plans that don't do such a great job at retaining those enrollees, which points to that there might be some differences in how plans are working to, to address the needs of these populations. Um, in some other work that we've recently done, we found that actually if you look at somebody um, when they enroll in a plan, by the end of five years, 50% of people will have left that plan and gone somewhere else, um, which is actually quite a high number. If we think that MA plans, part of the reason why we're investing in them is that they have an incentive to take care of beneficiary needs over a longer term. If half your members have sort of turned over in a five-year period, it might lessen some of those incentives around uh, sort of investing in someone's long-term uh, sort of care potential. Um, the last thing I, I was going to talk about, but I think Erica already uh, summarized it really well, is sort of what we know about the payment differences between these programs. Um, and uh, I, I won't repeat a lot of the numbers, but we do know that there are sort of imbalances in payments due to issues around um, selection uh, into the plan. We've done some uh, into MA plans as well as around issues around coding intensity. We've done a lot of work trying to understand the different tools that plans use to, to increase coding through chart reviews, health risk assessments that lead to a lot 
lot of increased payment. Um, but we've also found that this uh, issues around the benchmark and issues around sort of risk selection are a major problem as well. And in areas that have the highest MA penetration, there are sort of the most imbalances in, in how the payments work. Um, so I think just to summarize, uh, the research is it, it's pretty mixed. I, I think that we still don't know nearly as much about the MA program as we should. And I think one of the other limitations of a lot of the research, and I've touched on this a little bit, is that a lot of the work to date has sort of focused on MA versus TM, calling MA a single program. And we can think about MA as a single program in some ways in terms of the overall budgetary impact. But plans are doing really different things from each other. And I think that that isn't necessarily as well understood as it needs to be to know which are the plans that are legitimately delivering on sort of the promise of these improved outcomes and which plans uh, maybe aren't so much and are engaging in more of these behaviors that we might not think are most optimal. Um, the one other area, and, and I think going back to some of John's points earlier, where we know very little is around sort of these supplemental benefits. And, and I didn't talk about it here because basically we have no data on what the actual quality of these benefits look like, what the utilization looks like. Um, and so a lot of beneficiaries are enrolling in these plans that have these supplemental benefits, but we don't know that much about what the actual value of those benefits are to sort of health outcomes. And that's hopefully an area that we can continue building in uh, sort of moving forward. Um, so I, I look forward to sort of discussing this more. Happy to, to talk about more of the research. And I'll hand it over to uh, Aaron from there. All right, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Erin Fusay Brown. I'm currently a law professor at George State University College of Law, but I am sh shortly shedding my law professor status, and I'm joining the team um, at Caper uh, to be the the lawyer, not the economist, to, <laughs> to be part of the le the legal and policy translation. So I'm very much excited. We've already started working together, and I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, so I'm here just to talk about that sort of what are the policy options? What do we do if we are concerned about the future of Medicare and Medicare Advantage and the role it's playing? Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of those specific policy options, but also how to think about policy options and what we need, I think, to start as, as I always start in any discussion of any policy of any topic, I say we, we need is more data. We need more transparency. Um, because as David mentioned, there's a lot of things we still just don't know, partly because the data are not gathered. And even if they are gathered, they're not made available in a way that we can study them and understand really what's going on. So I think that that is sort of the bedrock. But there are several opportunities from a policy standpoint to improve Medicare Advantage, both to save money and support the sustainability of the Medicare program overall, as well as to improve the experience of the Medicare beneficiaries who are, who are relying on these programs for, for their care. And given the plethora of policy options, I think it's helpful to think about what each one accomplishes in terms of what is the problem that it is trying to solve, who needs to act, whether it's Congress, because it takes an, an act of Congress or a change to the statute to make the change, or whether CMS has the regulatory authority already to make this change, or something else, right? So what combination or both actors um, can we target some policy interventions? And how much money will it save the Medicare program and taxpayers? I think that those three pieces of information are really helpful to think through what some of these policy options might look like. So for example, if the goal is to, if one goal is to improve fiscal sustainability of the Medicare program uh, without affecting plan quality or uh, necessarily plan availability or, or benefits, Congress could, right, could modify the base payment calculation via changes to the quartile system, and we've we've written about what that might look like, uh, to changes in the rebate calculations, and that might save $500 billion over a decade. And it could also, Congress could also reform the quality bonus payment system, um, for example, by making it budget neutral or eliminating double bonuses, which have not shown to you know, produce any sort of uh, significant effects in terms of improving quality. And that would save another 50 to $100 billion over a decade. Another thing we've heard about tonight is the concern about overpayments in the existing Medicare Advantage system. So if the goal is to reduce overpayments in Medicare Advantage, CMS already has a lot of regulatory tools at its disposal. So CMS could increase the coding intensity adjuster beyond the statutory 5.9% minimum. Or if an across the board increase is undesirable or too blunt of an instrument, CMS could implement could implement a variable coding intensity adjuster based on historic plan performance, based on the sort of heterogeneity that we see in the plan's behaviors on coding intensity. 
Additionally, CMS could expand efforts to recoup overpayments by improving the timeliness and scope of the RADV audit program, right, as it has already started to implement, but it could go even further. And CMS could also, under its existing authority, restrict the use of chart reviews and health risk assessments that have been used by MA plans to inflate, often artificially, the risk-adjusted um, payments. So these are things, again, I can easily say it like, oh, CMS, you have the regulatory authority, in my opinion, as a law professor sitting in my ivory tower, um, to do these things. Of course, all these things take resources, right? And so there's, a, there's, an, impl there's an implementation cost um, to, to these things that also require resources, and it also requires uh, a significant amount of, of data to justify any particular change. Um, but this, you know, under its existing authority, uh, could recoup 10 to $66 billion annually, right? So again, we're, we're talking $100 billion uh, minimum over the course of a decade. So if the goal is to improve the experience of beneficiaries, which I think has to be uh, certainly part of any policy goal, is to focus on the experience of the beneficiary, uh, one would be to improve the transparency that we have been hearing about oh, and oversight over the value of these supplemental benefits. What does it mean to sell a plan that has a vision benefit? And I was just talking to my sister-in-law, who was saying that under her Medicare Advantage plan, she has to... she. She says, I, I got vision, it's so great. And I was like, so, she's like, and I need to go to the eye doctor. Um, and I said, so what, what, what's prevented you from going to the eye doctor? She says, well, it's the nearest eye doctor um, who will take my plan is 50 miles away. And she's like, I can't drive 50 miles to go to the eye doctor, like that's just not an option. So for her, she might as well not have a vision benefit. And, we, and in, the, in the span of having this conversation, we drove by like three optometrists. Um, but it was, none of them were in her network. So she could not actually access this. So what is the value of these benefits? How much are they being used? What is the actuarial value of these, of these benefits, let alone um, their network quality? So that would be one thing to study. The, again, we've heard a lot from Med Medicare beneficiaries about uh, frustrations with prior authorization and the rate of denials and just knowing, again, how often are there differential, you know, are plans doing prior authorization denials at different rates? We hear that, you know, anecdotally, it seems to be the case. Um, and, and whether they are, um, and how much of a burden does that place on the beneficiary and when does it actually prevent them from accessing needed care? And another thing we would want to know is the fees and commissions that brokers and marketing um, agents are making on the backs of sort of pulling people into signing people up for Medicare Advantage plans um, that may not actually be the best uh, for them and, and what are their financial incentives and to what degree um, are, are these payments sort of steering people um, and, and affecting their choices and their outcomes. Uh, and finally, you know, there's this whole idea of once you're in, if you're a Medicare beneficiary into Medicare Advantage, are you giving up the possibility of ever switching to medic, traditional Medicare? Um, because even if it somehow stops serving your needs or you wake up and realize, I, I, I probably would be better off with a traditional Medicare, but I now can't afford a Medigap plan. Why? Because my diagnoses have been coded so intensively over the past few years, and now that I go and try to shop for a Medigap plan, which are not community rated, I am priced out, and I simply cannot afford um, a Medigap plan. And so in most states, that's the case. And so, you know, are there real barriers in terms of the lived experience for the Medicare beneficiary? And there are a lot of things we could do to improve um, the experience Experience. Again, a lot of it just starts with transparency and making this something that we can study and we can understand um, so that we can back up the anecdotal stories that we are certainly hearing um, with real data. Um, and then finally, to think about this, of course, it's, again, easy to say all these things to wave a magic policy wand, but the challenge is real, right? As, as the Medicare Advantage program um, becomes such a big part of Medicare, um, an increasingly large part of Medicare, it becomes politically very challenging to, to make any policy change around Medicare. Any small tweak, let alone a big one, um, to, try to, uh, to try to reform the Medicare Advantage system or payment program is going to face a huge political backlash from these Medicare Advantage plans that have become extremely powerful. Um, and they can 
and they can basically sow fear and confusion, that same fear and confusion that we heard John talk about, um, when your Medicare Advantage plan says the sky is falling to their enrollees and say, you know, this is a cut. This is going to be um, a cut to your benef benefits. We may not be able to offer you $0 premiums. We won't be able to offer you the same benefits as before because of what, you know, the government is doing to our payments. That sows real fear, and that fear is a very powerful political force. Um, and so that, I think, is the biggest challenge, is as it becomes so big, it's hard to touch it. Um, but touch it, we must, and think about it, because of the just the sheer dollars that are coming through the Medicare Advantage program, um, and how much that money really could be used to reinvest, to strengthen the entire Medicare program, including traditional Medicare, to pay for things like uh, vision and dental and the things that Medicare beneficiaries beneficiaries so desperately want, as well as out-of-pocket caps and, and cost-sharing uh, limits that, you know, again, come with a Medicare Advantage plan, but they don't necessarily realize um, what the trade-offs are. So those that, that money isn't just, you know, the growth with we do nothing, it'll just continue to grow. The overpayments, the sort of the sense that we are spending too much on Medicare Advantage, um, again, comes at a cost of, of draining the f financial and fiscal sustainability of the entire Medicare program for everyone. Um, so when we think about saving money in Medicare Advantage, I think it is, yes, it's a desirable goal in and of itself, because this is taxpayer dollars after all, but it's important to think about that money as a, as a potential reinvestment opportunity to capture it, to pay for um, improving both the Medicare Advantage experience, but also the, the strength of the traditional Medicare program to be the public option to compete with um, and put pressure on the Medicare Advantage plans um, in order to make the whole system work better for everyone. Um, with that, I'll stop and we can open it up for discussion. Um, so let me, I'll, I'll start with a couple questions and then maybe we can just move to audience questions. Um, let, me, let me just kind of play out this even playing field concept. It, it's really kind of come up in all the remarks here where we think there's this dynamic of plans being overpaid and then they use those overpayments to offer, you know, entice beneficiaries to join through supplemental benefits, other strategies. And we think it kind of leads to this enrollment dynamic that we've seen, at least is a big part of it. And so that might not be optimal. So what would it look like? And just in um, a broad sense, maybe I'll ask you, Erica, first, um, maybe from a benefits perspective, conceptually, what would it look like to try to even that playing field between MA and TM? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's some key differences between traditional Medicare and MA that would need to be addressed to kind of make them more comparable in terms of the benefits that are offered. I mean, one big thing is that in traditional Medicare, like there's not dental and hearing and vision, and those are pretty core benefits that people are used to having in their employer sponsored insurance. And so I think thinking about how you can do that in traditional Medicare, and as um, was mentioned in the policy options, you know, that would cost money. And so one way you could potentially think about paying for that is by reducing the overpayments in MA and redistributing some of that to traditional Medicare to do that. I think another big thing is there's no kind of out-of-pocket cap in traditional Medicare. Um, and so it's more open-ended in terms of the cost that people could pay out of pocket on an annual basis. And, tr and Medicare Advantage does have a hard out-of-pocket cap. Um, and so that's a key thing, I think, from a beneficiary perspective, knowing that their spending is limited in some way um, is really important. So I would say those would be the couple big things. Um, that I would mention. I think there also are some differences we could think about, like in terms of what the beneficiary experiences, and like is someone kind of coordinating their care and things like that, and improvements that could be made on the traditional Medicare side um, to deal with some of that and to just like simplify things, right? Like MA 
looks a lot more like the employer at sponsored insurance people are using are used to having traditional Medicare where someone has traditional Medicare then they might have a Part D plan then they have a Medigap plan like I think thinking about ways that we could potentially simplify some of that mm -hmm. Aaron David did you want to offer anything to that question yeah, I mean, I think the, the only thing I would just add to that is, um, so I, I mean, it, it might be the case that MA plans, the argument that you often hear is that it's okay to accept some amount of overpayment to MA plans because that's being reinvested in offering these benefits. But, but I think just like taking a step back from like a first principles standpoint, it doesn't necessarily make sense to hope that the right type of benefit's going to get invested in by overpaying in a totally different area that's unrelated to the provision of those benefits. And so, you know, while, and I think it's unclear if this is actually the case, if these supplemental benefits are delivered bring on sort of that increased value to make up for what we think are sort of inflated payments. And so I, I think that when thinking about the way to optimize the policy around this, it, it probably isn't to you know, allow for excess payments to happen in one way and hope that that comes around to maximize benefit provision in a different way. We probably want to tackle the benefit provision piece a little bit more head on than that. Just raise one other issue. You know, are we, do we need to have advertisements on buses for traditional Medicare? Like, do we need to have agents for traditional Medicare? Because, I mean, is that part of an even playing field? Should we just assume that, to John's point, like, the beneficiaries are going to find their way to the right plan here? Or is the environment such that it's, even from a, you know, marketing information perspective, skewed so much towards MA that some sort of equal and opposite intervention is required as part of this evening. I don't know about the traditional <laughs> Medicare advertising, um, but I will say I think there are things you can do even on the Medicare Advantage side to limit some of that more. And the administration has taken some steps to do this and to regulate marketing. I think there's ways in which they could go further. Like for example, in the most recent um, kind of um, proposed rule for Medicare Advantage, there are limits to the broker and agent compensation in Medicare Advantage. It doesn't affect what they're paying on the traditional Medicare side, and most agents and brokers are still making much less for enrolling people in Medigap um, in, in traditional Medicare than in Medicare Advantage. And so there are some steps that you could do to go further, even through Medicare Advantage regulations, I think, around marketing, around agent and broker compensation to kind of level the playing field on some of this. So that might be dialing down MA rather than dialing up TM, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. All right, got it. Let me ask uh, one other question, and then I'd love uh, for people who have questions for the panel to uh, come to the front. Um, we, we also heard several um, <coughs> observations about variation in terms of how plans act and uh, how, much, how much they might overcode the quality of their networks and patient experience. I, I guess, uh, what does it mean from an oversight regulatory perspective that these plans that seem to operate so differently are able to kind of exist on kind of, an, again, just like equals in the marketplace. You know, that what, there doesn't seem to be, you know, the, the right, I'm just, this is a question, are there the right policy levers that are kind of um, limiting this variation that we think is not uh, perhaps aligned with the policy or, or um, beneficiary interest, like, what does it mean how we should be thinking about transparency and um, just regulatory oversight in light of this variation that everyone mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there are a lot of challenges here. And, and so I think, like, thinking about sort of coding intensity issues. So there's sort of the flat pattern adjustment of 5.9%. So all plans get their risk kind of deflated by, by that amount, or the payments decrease by that amount. Um, but there are some plans that probably code a lot more than 5.9% higher. And there are some plans that might actually code less than that. And, and I think when you set a single benchmark that all plans need to meet, a challenge with that is that um, some plans that might be, you know, perhaps not 
not engaging in some of this activity that we think is suboptimal might be harmed by some of these sort of policies. And I think without having some accounting for that, it, it can be challenging to you know expect everybody to play on the same playing field when you know some plans to just have a different ability to do these things. Um, I, I think one area where you know hopefully, or, or at least you would hope that some of this variation between plans ends up being captured um, is in something like the star rating system. Is that you can use the star ratings and you're rewarding some plans that are receiving, that are delivering better quality of care, and you're not rewarding the plans that are not delivering better quality of care. I, I think the challenge, though, is whether the current measures that are in the star ratings are actually doing sort of what needs to be done to, to kind of capture that. And um, we've done work that, that tends to find that when people enroll in a higher rated plan, that doesn't necessarily translate into to better outcomes. And, and so some plan, and, and a lot of plans are sort of getting these bonus payments for, for being highly rated. And so there could be opportunity there that star ratings inherently capture some of the variation across plans. What types of measures might we be able to incorporate into that that do better deal with kind of this variation and sort of incentivize plans to, to kind of try to improve these, these different services? Something I might, I might add to if I could take your question in a slightly different direction. I think there is real opportunity in being able to get something done given the variation across plans. So one thing you saw with like the agent and broker proposals, for example, is that some of the smaller plans were really supportive of it. And there's the notion of leveling the playing field across traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. I think a thing that's also become increasingly more salient is how do we level the playing field across Medicare Advantage plans? And I think that is, um, like to Aaron's point, I think the program is large, it is popular, it is hard to make changes to it. Um, but given the variation in plans, I think that also creates an opportunity to design policy in a way that does do more to increase competition within the Medicare Advantage market and see some of the smaller plans that might be losing out because they don't code as aggressively, for example, um, kind of benefit from some of the reforms. And I think one place where the variation, I think, is corrected or it's designed to be corrected for now is in the audit, the RADV audit. Um, pay and chase kind of model where you pay first and then you then you audit the plans that have the historic patterns of the most uh, coding intensity um, and then you detect more overpayments there and then recoup it at a later date of course plans can defer and appeal and clog uh, the, the the eventual date of repaying the overpayment and so um, I think in some ways if we rely on the the audit process to adjust for some of the variation, then we are, you know, it, it allows the sort of gaming of the pay and chase methodology um, when the appeals process can get backlogged, when the audit process is already delayed. And so expanding resources for the scope um, of, of auditing, uh, you know, streamlining the appeals process so that it can't be just drawn out um, and clogged into, the, you know, well into the future, uh, I think would go a long way because a lot of that is not captured up front. It's, it's captured at the back end, but then right now CMS sort of struggles to, to recoup that money um, even when it has very good reason to do so. All right, well, it's a very bashful crowd here. Let me, let me just make one other observation. I mean, so well, something that hasn't come up is the kind of provider side and these arrangements um, with respect to integrated systems, systems with, with plans and uh, providers that are either controlled by the plan or by you know, a parent organization. And so this has been, um, you know, you, this is something that obviously United has pursued, but then many other plans are doing this in a different level. And, you know, I guess I'm, my question is what kind of, um, what are the implications of this type of new type, this new uh, market movement? Does it make reform meaningfully different? Is it, is this, are we moving towards this ideal where the providers and the plans are integrated, which we've said has always been the problem that they're not? We have an agency problem between plans and providers. Is this helping to solve it? Or is this creating new problems? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really, a really great question, and, and this is an area that we, we've started doing some work in, and we've found that now about 15, 20 percent of MA beneficiaries are enrolled in plans that are fully owned by health systems or plans that own health systems themselves, and and that's not including United, which owns a, a lot of provider practices. This is, um, you know, your Kaisers of the world, but then also uh, XYZ Academic Medical Center often has their own Medicare Advantage plan now that people are enrolling in, and some effort to, to kind of integrate services. Um, I mean, I think there, there are clearly some, some opportunities there. I, I think that when you have this alignment between the uh, payment of care and the delivery of care, there could be better coordination between sort of the providers and the plan payment. It could help with some issues around um, prior authorization and, and sort of access. I think where some of the challenges come from is when the distance between issues around like coding intensity get a much smaller. Um, so if you're an integrated health system, uh, you might have ways that your electronic health record much more directly reports codes to your billing system and so it might be more challenging for like an auditing process for like the RADV audits to find where there's gaps between like a chart uh, like a medical chart and you know what gets coded for a person so I think there are some challenges that come from the very different incentives in these types of arrangements and there hasn't been much research on, on sort of these types of systems yet and so it's an area where there's opportunity I think to kind of learn more where we're headed. I think I'd also make a distinction between um, clinical integration and financial integration. And I think when we think about like the provider and plan being combined, we think about like a Kaiser Permanente and like kind of the care coordination that happens there. I think what we're seeing with a lot of the consolidation that's happening now is financial integration, but without necessarily the clinical integration that we'd like to see from that. And so I think there are opportunities to see Im improvements potentially from kind of plans um, increasingly buying up provider practices. This has been a really big thing with primary care practices in particular, but I think there are some, I think what we're seeing now is maybe a little bit more downsides in terms of coding intensity city increase market power and, and things like that. I don't know that we've quite realized the clinical integration part of it in a lot of cases yet. And I think some of the downsides are, are hitting the providers that are being acquired yeah. because they are um, being put under a lot of pressure to increase the coding intensity in ways that might um, feel professionally or even morally wrong um, or be, feel fraudulent. And so I think a lot of, you know, when we see, you know, CVS, Aetna owning the plan, the pharmacy, the pharmacy benefit manager, and then the primary care practice and the home health provider and all the data that connects them. Um, is that a concern from an antitrust standpoint? I start to feel like it is. It's a form of consolidation that mm -hmm. sort of soup to nuts. Um, and so there's a, a lot of uh, you know, concern there about steering your, you know, your, the beneficiary, capturing their, their whole sort of book of business all the way through from their primary care visit all the way up to their pharmacy. Um, and then their plan payments. And so, you know, the, the antitrust person in me is skeptical that that um, is going to yield the efficiencies uh, that, that everyone promises that integration will. Please, um, when, when you start, yeah. I, I guess I'll follow up on the provider side. You can, know, you, can you just on introduce the, yourself to Oh, hi, I'm Josh Gordon with the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Um, my, I, I, on the provider side, kind of the opposite way, you hear reports of um, MA plans trying to pay lower than Medicare rates for hospitals and then getting into these disputes. So I'm wondering, one, I'm not really sure why that happens actually with all the overpayments, but also what do we think the future is of the negotiations between um, MA plans and the hospitals and, and doctors on, on payments? You know, my best read of that question is that the rates are pretty similar, and for a bunch of reasons, it's hard for plans to negotiate rates that are that different. Um, and what you definitely hear is a hassle factor that providers have to deal with the kinds of denials, the kind of prior out, the kind of um, um, just annoyances that doesn't happen under TM. So I view the, the, the tension there is more around issues of like network inclusion and just the um, administrative burden rather than rates itself. I don't know if you guys have any a different read on that. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the, the, the research evidence is, is kind of mixed on, on what 
the, the rate differences might look like, and, and there actually isn't a whole lot of work on that because it's hard to, to sort of see what those negotiated rates are. Um, but we've definitely heard um, both, uh, especially anecdotally, that these hassle factors are, are sort of a big issue. Um, uh, related to some of the things we, we mentioned earlier about sort of mental health providers being uh, not as included in MA networks, one of the things that we've heard sort of anecdotally from talking with people is that the hassle factor is a huge issue there because there's a lot of paperwork that like a therapist might need to fill out in order to get reimbursed. Um, and it, it, if you're like a sole practicing like mental health therapist in a community, that's a lot to sort of take on in terms of administrative burdens to stay in network for a few plans. And so um, there are certainly challenges there. That's sounding cons conspiratorial. One has to assume that Part of the reason mental health providers have not made it in, in rich numbers into Medicare Advantage is people with mental health issues are much more expensive. And so it, it may be a way to do selection as well. I and mean, you guys, I don't know to what extent you think that. I, I have a question that, for the group that I just wanted to quickly ask, and I know we have other people who want to ask questions. One of the, in two of John's three stories, the issue of network adequacy, am I going to be able to see the doctor I need, uh, am I going to get good quality care, was sort of underlying the fear factor. Um, how do we deal with that? I think we can all live with like a little extra money going into you know dog walking benefits as long as the healthcare benefits are really strong. The fear here is they're skimping on the healthcare benefits and network adequacy and, and bringing people in through dog walking benefits. Again, nothing against dog walking benefits, which are, <laughs> as, as a dog owner, I, I love that idea, but can't be the primary reason. Um, so I don't know if people have thoughts on how do we ensure that network adequacy is, is really there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one, one place where, where some of the challenge starts is at the time of enrolling in a plan, it's very hard to know what that network is going to look like and, and what sort of issues around prior authorization and care access might end up being. Um, I, I think it's been documented by others that a lot of sort of public network information isn't necessarily that accurate. Uh, plans don't necessarily report well who's actually included in their networks. And actually, even if you report who's included in your networks, whether those doctors are accepting new patients is kind of a different question altogether. And so I think that some of this can start in some of the information maybe that we're providing when people enroll in plans. Um, right now, you can see things like the uh, check boxes for the types of supplemental benefits that are offering. You can see some information on cost sharing. You can see the premium. You can see the star rating. And there could potentially be opportunities to report more information on uh, denials of care, on what network adequacy looks like. So when you're trying to make that initial plan choice, um, you're kind of working off more information. I, I know that there are probably big challenges in actually doing that in practice, but, but I think that there's potential there to help at the time of enrolling to remove some of that uncertainty, because it, it's hard to know if I enroll in a plan that has a $0 premium and like a four-star rating, I don't know what that's going to mean when it comes to I want to go and find a doctor or I, you know, I'm going to have the benefits I need. And, and I think we need to get to a place where people can make more informed decisions. When you have 30 plans to choose between, you need to be able to choose a plan that that, um, you know, will hopefully work for you. Or the star rating really needs to incorporate those metrics in a way that is much more powerful as opposed to just a small uh, factor. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amol Navathe. I'm a vice chair of MedPAC and uh, here in my personal capacity as a Penn faculty member. So I have two quick questions. Well, I don't know how quick they'll be, but I have two questions. Um, so the first one is, you know, given the plan payment generosity that we see, uh, why, you know, Erica, you highlighted the fact that many markets have one dominant player. Why, why don't we have more competition in MA? And what can we do to make it more competitive? That's kind of question one. Question two is um, for David. So you, you highlighted, so at MedPAC, obviously, we've been doing a lot of work around selection. And you framed it kind of two different ways. So you said, we look at AMI mortality, and we see they're converging, and that's because selection's getting better. And then you said, on the other hand, if we look at markets like Puerto Rico or some, or some other area from a payment perspective, you know, selection's not getting better. It's actually getting worse. Mathematically, that makes sense that that could happen as you get a more and more selected group that's not in MA. So, so I was just hoping you could reconcile those two different kind of directions for me and, and how you're thinking about selection. Yeah. Thanks. 
So maybe just on the competition point first, I think some of it is that you see more overpayments going to some of the larger plans that have more market share and are engaging more aggressively in coding. Like if you look at just at coding, for example, which is a big source of the overpayments, there is quite a bit of variation across plans. And you do have even some small plans where their coding is less than the 5.9% adjustment that CMS currently makes. That's the minimum statutory adjustment they have to make. Um, and then you have some plans and like the tail is quite, is quite large. Like you have some plans that are like way out on the tail. And so I think that is part of it. And I think that's why in the policy solutions, like we probably do really want to do a lot of these things in a way that recognizes that variation across plans. Um, I think another one is like on the marketing, like part of the broker and agent thing is that some of the large plans could afford to pay much more in the broker and agent compensation and, and can afford to pay a lot more for like marketing expenses. And so that kind of creates this unlevel playing field. And I think even though the payment generosity is like high for the program as a whole, it does vary quite a bit in terms of what plans are really benefiting from that. Um, and I think some of what, I think some plans, you know, made more of an assessment of like, we want to stay in the more focused on the ESI market or like in the individual market and like didn't earlier on like get as much into the Medicare Advantage market. I think now over the past decade or so, especially seeing how profitable that market is, some of the plans that initially didn't bet on the Med Medicare Advantage market, like now really would like to have a larger market share there and play more of a role there. And so I think that's creating some of the support for um, some of the policies that do kind of account for the variation and try to dampen that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think on, on the selection question, I, I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, it's it, it's a really challenging question to, to answer and to actually understand what is happening when it comes to selection between these plans, because you can't necessarily look at how risk is coded in MA and say, OK, this is actually how sick people are versus, you know, what the risk coding looks like in TM. It, it, it is difficult to sort of measure what, what the actual selection looks like. Um, what, what seems to be the case and, and what, um, you know, my read of literature is, and, and I'd be curious to hear also what, what yours is, is that there was this time when it was thought when MA was 20%, that was a very specific 20%. And it was a, a set of people who were more heavily recruited to enroll in their plans. But I think, as was mentioned earlier, it's also easy now to make a lot of money off of people who have more complex care needs as well. And so um, as that payment has sort of become more possible for more complex patients, it, it is easier to be able to justify sort of recruiting complex patients into your plans. But they also then might have sort of poor health outcomes in the long run. So it's it seems like we're at the point where you're split 50-50. It might be harder to, um, you know, choose some number of people who are, you know, performing better or who might, you know, do better for you or do worse for you. I think Puerto Rico is a very different issue altogether because it's like 95% MA. So the 5% who are in TM probably look very different than the 95% who are in MA. Um, and I think there's some uh, research and uh, that um, has come out that among the people who are in TM, many of them don't have any claims within a year, and then so it's unclear. Are they seeking care from sort of different systems altogether? It's very, um, but when you're in a situation where it's only 5%, it, it's likely to be very different. So I don't know if I have a good answer to kind of that question. I think what we're trying to do in some of our work now is find other ways that we can benchmark the selection. So instead of comparing out like what the risk coding looks like, are there other ways that we can measure health status to try and get a better sense of what, um, you know, unbiased measures of health status that can be used to measure, you know, how sick are people in one plan? versus have sicker people on another plan versus in TM. And that's what we're hoping to explore to answer these questions. But I think it's a, it's a challenging area to research. All right, let's do a couple more questions, and then we'll. Joel Michaels. I uh, teach uh, at uh, the Arizona State University Law School and University of Maryland Law School on health insurance reform. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is, and Aaron referred to it, the sub, what I'll call the supplemental benefits addiction. Uh, unless you sort of cut that tie, it will be very difficult to make any of these changes. And even with the tools uh, that the agency has, I sometimes get the sense that they feel constrained because if the revenue is taken away from the plans, as you say, they'll turn to their natural constituents, senior citizens who are very loud, the AARP and so forth, and say, you can't do that. And, and so two examples I can think of. One is the uh, intensity coding adjustment factor. Was it really aggressively applied uh, to curb some of the excessive coding that was used by the plans? And then uh, with the risk adjustment data validation audits, 
the government won a very important court case that gave them the legal authority to recoup money, substantial monies going back for an extended period of time. And they, they made the decision to cut it off at a certain period of time, going back a few years, not all the way back, for all the overpayments that have been made. So my question, I think, is unless you break that connection somehow, either legislatively, it's never going to correct itself. And even the agency will feel constrained in what they can do. Comments? You want to take that, Aaron? Yeah. Um Hi, Joel. Um, I, I, I agree. I think that there's sort of like within, there's the how do you tinker within the system as it currently is, but I think you're right. The incentives are and the, the constraints are so great because of the way that MA looks so different, um, both in supplemental benefits and just the, the way it's structured and the way it's paid, but also the, the linkage between the two um, and this idea of uh, and the risk adjustment. Uh, I think you're right. There's always going to be some incentive to inflate the ap apparent sickness of the population so long as, you know, I mean, we need to risk adjust, but now we're seeing that, like, anytime you risk adjust, there's an opportunity for fraud. Um, so I think that, you know, when we sort of comment on these things, we always, you know, tell the agency, like, yes, what you're doing is good and do more, right? Because, but I think you're right that, that at some level it has to be, it's up to Congress. Um, to change these fundamental payment methodologies. Otherwise, we're sort of going to just be tinkering on the margins. Let's do one last question. And by the way, then we, then we have reception. People can come up and ask questions <laughs> on their own. It's just as a group, I think. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name's Sheila Ranganathan. Um, I'm with the Health Policy and the Law Initiative at O'Neill Institute. Um, I had a question for Aaron. I was just wondering, um, you were talking about some antitrust concerns with health system integration in the MA space. Um, are there any cases that you're tracking right now, or do you think that there are going to be any, like, is there going to be more litigation in that space? Um, and if you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, I, I think the antitrust uh, agencies need to notch a win on a vertical theory, meaning vertical consolidation is, is the consolidation between different you know, production factors in the supply chain. And historically, um, the FTC has, has, you know, been fairly successful for hospital hor horizontal mergers or um, other types of horizontal mergers, and the theory is very well established there. And there, I think to date, is very few, there are very few vertical challenges that have succeeded in front of a court. Because, as, you know, the, even though the economic evidence is piling up that there may be um, some anti-competitive effects there, I think the, the the party line has been clinic, uh, integration. Vertical integration is good for care. It's going to create efficiency. It's going to create economies of scale. It's going to create care coordination. It's going to benefit everyone. This is what we're going for, is Kaiser Permanente for everyone. Um, and I think that now we're starting to, that's where we need sort of the economists to, to say that if there is a problem, it's, you know, it needs to be documented very clearly about how that anti-competitive impact happens it, because I think the courts are going to be very skeptical for quite some time, even though the merger guidelines just changed, um, and, and embrace this concept that, yes, a vertical or non-horizontal merger can be anti-competitive. I think that that's, um, th that's all fine and good until, we, until the antitrust agencies notch a big win from a court, convincing a court to say, you know, yes, in fact, we buy that as a theory of antitrust law. All right. Um, let, me, let me just wrap us up here. Um, very quickly with, with a couple of reflections. And the conversation around uh, antitrust reminds me of the old line of consolidation is not integration. And we have often confused those two terms. Um, and so it's not even just about financial co consolidation versus clinical consolidation. Even cl clinical consolidation is not integration. And what we really want is integration. And the corollary to that is people often talk about Kaiser Permanente as the model. And I remind people, Kaiser is a great health system. Even Kaiser has not figured out how to replicate Kaiser. The idea that random health systems joining up with insurance plans, buying up physician offices, magically creates Kaiser. One has to be skeptical of, of, uh, of such an idea. Um, this was a fantastic conversation and really got us, what got us started was John and laying out critical questions about how are we paying in what is now the majority of beneficiaries in Medicare? How are we thinking about risk adjustment? What are the core goals of 
making sure that people are getting access and quality, um, you know, what are the right set of, of benefits? And then the principle that we've often talked about in lots of other industries, um, choice is good. We, we, we as Americans, like, by the way, that's just like, that is as American as you get. Choice is good. Um, we all want choice. But you can get to a point where choice becomes a problem in this complexity architecture in terms of allowing people uh, to end up where they want to be. And so um, there are some very, very big policy questions in front of us over the next uh, months, years ahead uh, with Medicare Advantage. And of course, Medicare Advantage's future is so now directly tied to traditional Medicare, or you could argue TM's future is so directly tied uh, to MA that these are now really deeply linked questions. And for really hard policy questions like this, uh, you know, what you ultimately need is really good evidence in a timely fashion focused on the questions that policymakers are asking. And that was really the motivation for creating the center uh, at Brown. And I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, who is on the panel. Um, two people are part of that center. Uh, David and Andy, one person's about to join that center, and one person has been a really important uh, partner and supporter of that center, Erica Socker from Arnold Ventures. So let's, just a quick round of applause to the panel. Um, and there's a lot of expertise in the room. I mean, you already heard it in the question. So um, let's, we're gonna stick around. We have um, a reception. Next door, I guess. Yes, thank you, Megan. Um, which I presume means food and drink. Um, please stick around, continue the conversation. And again, thank you all for taking time this evening to be here.